Good morning. Man, it's so good to see you. Hey, let's stand to our feet as we prepare to worship the Lord through song. Man, welcome to University Baptist Church, and thank you to those who are joining us online as well. I want to encourage us by reading a scripture. This uh, Psalm 36, verse 5 says this, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. I love that. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. In your light, do we see light. Man, I absolutely love that. Let's worship the Lord together this morning, church, as we sing. The Lord has called us out of darkness into His glorious light. Let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame And who could care that kind of weight it was my turn till I met you oh, I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide was my tomb till I met you. Oh, you called my name and I ran out of that grave. 
wonders for us. We thank you. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, oh, you called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you called my scripture together for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves we've been brought forth from darkness into glorious light church and that's a reason to sing and that's a reason to celebrate let's sing this together I needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I need a shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name
Lord this morning. Hallelujah. We praise your name, oh God. Absolutely, absolutely. We praise the name of Jesus. There's power in that name, amen? The Bible says in Philippians 2, verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him on him, this is Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We sing praises to your name, O God. We thank you for who you are and for what you've done. Your name is sweet to our ears, and so we bless you this morning. Good morning, University Baptist Church. It's great to see you all here. Uh, it's really great to worship with you this morning. A uh, special welcome back to all of our, our college students getting ready to kick off this year. We're glad that y'all are back. Uh, welcome, yeah, we can clap for them. They're great. They've got a great college minister too, I've heard, so that's good. Um, if you're with us online, welcome this morning again. Like I said, my name is Jason Simon. I lead the youth and college ministry here at University Baptist Church, and it's uh, a great joy in my life to do that. Uh, it's a great joy in my life to come up here and share with you all what's happening in the life of our church. And there is a lot happening in the life of our church this morning. I don't know if you've ever run a marathon, but these announcements might feel a little bit like that. 
Um, but it's really good because that means we have so much to praise God for, for what's happening in and through this place. So y'all keep doing amazing things and we'll just keep taking lots of time for announcements because I love it. Um, so first, if you are a guest with us, and I didn't scare you off with that intro, um, if you would scan the QR code on the back of your pew, uh, if you're here in the sanctuary with us or if you're with us online, uh, you can follow the link that's there in the chat. And um, we would love to get some information from you just to know how to follow up with you, how, to, how we can come alongside you as a church, what we can do to serve you or plug you into the life of our church or this community. Uh, maybe you've been visiting for a while or, or are interested in just learning more about us. We'd love to get your information to make that happen. So please um, fill out that Connect card. Um, tonight, so I said welcome college students. Most of our college students have either started back or start back within the next couple of weeks. Um, tonight, we start back with our, our semester worship during, uh, during the fall semester. So it's called The Table. That's our ministry for college students. It's Bible study, it's worship, it's of course dinner. Uh, and it's right over here in the chapel next door to this room, next door to our sanctuary, just right next door, it's in the chapel. It'll be at 6.30, so that's a little bit of a change from last year. We're going to be at 6.30. Um, tonight will just be a let's come get together, let's say hello. We're going to have um, ice cream and stuff to hang out and just get to know one another. And then next week, we'll lean into uh, our Bible study. So we're really excited about that. If you're a college student or just a college-aged young adult, you don't have to be in school, come by at 6.30 tonight here in the chapel, hang out with us. We'd love to have you there. Another awesome thing kind of related to that college ministry, one thing that our college students are passionate about is prayer. Uh, and we're passionate about that as a church, and what they've done is put together a team of people who are gonna lead, um, or maybe not lead is the right word, but they're gonna have the chapel open every day, Monday through Friday, from seven to eight, um, for morning prayer. So if you need a space to come pray, if you need to get out of your house, or if you're across the street and you wanna come over, this is not just for college students, this is for any church member. We will have the chapel open every Monday through Friday, starting at 7 a.m., beginning tomorrow. So you guys come up here, um, you're welcome to pray in the chapel, we'll have people there. Um, the space is just yours though. You can come use it how you need that morning. We also have coming up this week, a quarterly business meeting. It'll be on Wednesday, the 25th at 7.30 or 6.30, 6.30. It's gonna be on Zoom. So if you would like the information for that, just reach out to Sarah. Her information's there on the screen um, or you could find her wandering around. Sarah, you're the best. Um, and get the information for our business meeting from her. We also have, like I said, if you're interested in, in getting to know our church, uh, know more about us, next Sunday, immediately after church, we're gonna have a get to know you um, time where you can come and just learn about UBC. You can have lunch and uh, there will be some of our staff members there to answer questions, let you know everything happening. That'll be just about halfway down the mile long hallway in Harris Hall. So uh, you're welcome to attend that. That's next Sunday, uh, the 29th. Also, are y'all still with me? Do we need to do calisthenics? We're still good? Okay. Um, September 8th, we have uh, pretty much all of our Wednesday night stuff kicking off. Uh, we have stuff for children, stuff for youth. We have our renewal ministries launching. Um, so that's Wednesday, September 8th. Uh, many maestros for our really young kids. That'll all be happening here in the life of the church. So be up here on Wednesday night starting September 8th. It all kicks off right at 6.30. So be here. We'll have people to help you get where you need to go and, uh, or your students. And we're excited about that stuff happening. Okay, I kind of want to end with um, an announcement here. Um, if you're on our church email list, you might have seen an email come through, but uh, the eyes of the world are really pointed towards what's happening in the Middle East right now, specifically in Afghanistan. And um, we just have a burden on our heart to know how we can lean in as a church, how we can answer you know, that Matthew 25 call to, to feed those who need fed and to clothe those who need clothed and to share love all the way around. So there's a couple ways that we're doing that. There's actually... Um, a volunteer meeting tonight that World Relief is hosting. You can see the address there on the screen and the times for that. Um, if you want to know how you can get involved as an individual, or even if you have a group of people who might want to get involved, that would be a good place to go to get some information and uh, learn how World Relief is leaning into this, specifically with all the refugees that are coming from Afghanistan over here. Texas is one of a handful of states that have said we're going to welcome people into our borders. So the church needs to be there. We need to respond to that. So you can be there for, for that world relief meeting. Um, they're also, these people are coming with not very much at all. So um, they're collecting Walmart gift cards to help get these families started with things that they'll need to settle down here for however length of time they're going to do. So uh, we're collecting gift cards. There is, a, we have a box in the back. That's correct, right? We have a box, a basket in the, in the foyer where you can drop those gift cards at this week and next week if you want to grab those. Um, and then, of course, prayer. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that during the service, but we just wanted that to be on all of your minds um, to be thinking through. Uh, Shane Park is one of our church members who's kind of leading up this, this push, and he's going to be out here on the East Lawn right after the service. If you would like to talk with him, 
uh, you're welcome to make your way out there. We tend to save that space after the service just to kind of hang out, um, welcome new people in. It's just a space for us to fellowship. It's right out here on the East Lawn. So you exit, just keep walking around the sidewalk and you'll find us. And Shane will be out there. Uh, we can point you to him if you would like to get more information on that. So uh, there he is. We'll point you to him right now. Here he is. Um, so that's it. Uh, if you have questions, uh, that didn't cover everything. Uh, we'll tell you more on the East Lawn. But church, we're glad you're here. Um, thanks for being here to worship with us this morning. Matt's got one more announcement and then we'll throw it to our children. Yeah, uh, in case y'all weren't overloaded with all those announcements, I got one more for you. Um, so the music ministry, we're launching the choir for the fall, which we're super excited about. Um, so if you, if you sing or you enjoy singing or you just like music and you want to learn how to sing, man, we'd love to have you come join the choir. Uh, our first rehearsal is on Tuesday, September 7th. It's gonna be on, the rehearsals are going to be on Tuesday nights. Um, so yeah, email me, uh, it's, my email address should be on the website, it's just matt at ubcforward.org, and uh, we'd love to see you there. So with that, hey, let's have our kids come forward, and we'll have a uh, time with the children. Good morning, kids, come on up, have a seat up here. You notice we have something special today, it's going to be awesome, and look, Mr. Jeremiah is joining me too. So everybody come up and have a seat. Today we are going to be giving out Bibles to some of our children. So when um, kids come into first grade, we give them a special Bible that's all their own, and they can use it for, um, you know, for church like this or for Bible study and, um, when we have classes. And at home, too, you get to take it home with you. So this is really cool. Last year, we didn't get to do our Bible presentation with our first graders. So today, we're going to be giving Bibles to first graders and second graders that missed it last year. Okay? And some of our friends aren't here with us today, but they are watching online. So hi, guys. We're really glad you're here with us. And Mr. Jeremiah is going to take it from here. And I'll help. I'm going to collect the Bibles of the people who aren't here. So I'm going to stand nearby. Wait, let me try. How are y'all doing today? There it is. I like it. I feel so lucky to be up here to share with you all this morning. As you all know, that you typically get a chance to hear from Miss April and Mr. Kevin, who do a great job each week of teaching you guys wonderful things that we see in the Scripture. One of the things that I've I've heard them talk about uh, over the last several months and weeks is getting letters, right? And the way that we we talked about all the letters in Revelation. Raise your hand if you've ever received a letter from somebody. Let me see. Anybody ever received a letter? Okay, was it pretty cool to get a letter in the mail that was just for you and how special that was? You tend to get letters for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes you get letters for birthdays or because of anniversaries or something, Christmas or Easter, right? We get letters for a bunch of different reasons, which is really, really exciting. Well, I want to tell you all about one of my favorite letters I've ever received, okay? It's a special letter. It's one that I keep in my office in a very special place, all right? This was about five years ago, not quite five years ago, but I was coming to this church to be the pastor, and I'd never been a pastor before. It was a new job. You guys ever done something new that you've never done before, and you get kind of nervous, and you're thinking, I don't know if I'm going to be good at this. I don't know how to do any of these things, and you don't really know how to manage it. Well, that's what my situation was like. I was coming to this church, and I was like, I don't know how this is gonna go. And so I was trying to figure out what this job was gonna be like. I had some of those nerves. I was, had some of those concerns and those worries, didn't know how I would handle it. And guess what I got? I got a letter. And guess who the letter was from? It was from a bunch of first and second graders here at our church. And it was so cool. And if we had time, I would, I'd let you read all of them. But they're in their own handwriting, they sent me all these encouraging things to say, things about that they were excited about our church. They included even pictures of their family, right? And what's really cool is that now these first and second graders are older, and they're in our youth, and they're in sixth and seventh grade, and it's really cool to see how they've grown. But this letter and these words of encouragement really helped take away a lot of those concerns and a lot of those worries. It was a very special letter that I really took to heart. And it was really neat to receive it. And you know what that reminds me of, y'all? That reminds me that the greatest letter that we can ever receive is not one that has been written from somebody that we know that we have in our life, but the letters that we've received from God himself. Right? We're about to hand out these awesome Bibles to some of our first and second graders. And this is like God sending us a letter to say, you know what? 
I know that life can be scary at times. It can be hard at times. You may be confused on what to do, but I'm going to show you the way to handle it. I'm going to encourage you to get through it. And he gives us these Bibles to help us manage, right? And so when we have a chance to hold on to this, it's a special gift, just like this was a special gift to me, that when we give it out today, I hope you hold on to it and you read it and it can continually be a source of encouragement to you. Right now, here's what I would say. When you read the Bible, sometimes it can be a little confusing, okay? You'll probably find some things where you think, I don't understand what this means. And you might need help understanding. Who are some people that you could ask to help you understand what's in the Bible? Your parents, that's a great one, exactly. You, well, your three brothers, they can help you. Anybody else that you can ask to possibly help you. You can ask me, you can ask April, you can ask Kevin, you can ask people in the church, right? That's why we're here, is to help us all understand what God has to say to us so that he can help us navigate and get through this life. So I wanna say one more thing before we call on names, okay? I've read a lot of books and I've read a lot of letters in my life and there are some really special ones, some that eventually I put away. There's one book that I keep and I read over and over and over again and never gets boring and continues to encourage me. It's the most important book in my life. You know what it is? It's the Bible. And so I know that this is maybe your first one, maybe it's your second one, who knows, but I hope you know that this is the greatest book you can ever receive and that you cherish it all the days of your life, okay? All right, well, let's hand out some Bibles. Let me make sure I've got it to the right one. Layton. Wait, is there a right stack here? Okay. And we will, um, well, I'll collect those. Okay, is Leighton we'll here? say all of them. Leighton, I don't think Leighton is here. Okay. I'll take them. All right, let's see. Ireland. Did Ireland make it today? Oh, she, where is she? Right here? Oh, there she is. Ireland, here you are. Yeah, if you, if you hear your name, come on up. Come on up and grab your Bible, and we'll hand it to you. And then we're going to go take pictures out in the hallway. This is Sienna. I didn't see Sienna today, unless she's sitting in the back. Matthew Hudson. Here you go, buddy, right here. Toby Calders. Toby made it today. Toby's online, that's right. So we're gonna give this to you later. Colin, there's the man. Here you go, Colin. Eleanor Longacre, there we are. Here you go, Eleanor. Felicity, Felicity Frugé is watching online, so we'll get that to you. Alice Bowen, are the Bowens here today? Oh, that's right, okay. Hunter Madsen, all right, there you are, buddy. Here you go. Levi Owen, is Levi here today? No, he didn't. Online, Levi's online. Here, I'll set that one down. Your hands are getting full. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlie, Charlie Martinez, come on up, buddy. All right, parents, let's give them all a hand for receiving their Bibles this morning. Very exciting. So some of you older kids who already have one of these, you can encourage them to read it. Some of you younger ones, you'll get one soon. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for us. And if you didn't receive a Bible, you're going to go with Mr. Kevin and Phoebe out that door, correct? And if you did receive a Bible... You're going to stick with me and Miss April because we're going to go get a quick picture out in the hallway, okay? All right, let's pray together. Okay, put your hands together and let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you so much for these wonderful children. And we ask that you would bless them, God, with your word and that your word would dwell in them richly and lead their way, Father, that it would guide their steps and their path. Uh, we thank you for your word. Remind us of your love. And we pray that we would always cling to it and cherish it in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as the kids get ready to exit and head out there, we do have a quick video to show you all uh, from our stewardship team. So enjoy this video as we watch it.
Good morning, UBC family. My name is Sam Parrish, and I represent the Stewardship Ministry team here at UBC. Earlier in the year, we came to you all with a challenge, and I'm here before you this morning with an incredible update to that challenge. When we looked at our budgetary needs, we knew that we needed more families giving on a more consistent basis to be able to meet the goals that we had for ministry in this year. And over the last six or seven months, you all have stepped up in an incredible way. Every single month, we've seen an increase of 5% in the number of new people giving. Over the course of the year, we've had 165 individual families giving to the budget, a significant increase over this time last year. And I'm here to say thank you so much. It has made a major impact in the work that we're able to do and the work that we're hoping to do in the upcoming year. Now, we have a goal of 200 families giving on a month-to-month -month basis, and as you heard, we're still down in the 160s, and so there's still some room to go. If you're already giving, thank you so much. The money that goes into our church budget provides everything from the Bibles that we're able to provide to our first graders to the boiler that no one thinks about. If you haven't given before, we try and make this as easy as we can. You're able to give weekly when you come here. We have an app through Gibla Givelify, if you're giving through Givelify, though, we do want you to know that there is a small fee that the app charges for us to be able to use that platform. If you'd like to give in a convenient way and have been using that, we'd love to speak with you about how you might be able to give automatically through the church office, or maybe utilize one of the bill pay functions that your bank offers. You can come see me after the service or another member of our ministry team to see how we might be able to get that set up for you. This is an incredible journey of stewardship that the Lord has called us to, and we want you to join us in that. The blessing that comes from being able to see what he's done through this church over the last year and the many years up to this point is incredibly encouraging. We want you with us in it. As this new school year begins and we move towards a new budget year, we would love for you to take some time to consider how the Lord might be asking you to engage with us in this stewardship journey. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing that you have allowed us to participate in over the course of this last year as you have stirred your people to give to the work that you're doing through the ministries of UBC. Thank you for the blessing that it is to be a part of that, to see what you're doing and see how the gospel is moving forward in the midst of difficult days. I pray that you would move in the hearts of the people here today um, and those who are a part of this church um, who have not been able to give or haven't been able to give at the level that they wanted to, that they would know that their time, their money, their efforts, and everything that you have blessed them with has a place in the kingdom work that you're doing at this church. I pray that you would bless the rest of this service, the words that are spoken from your word, and that we would be fertile soil to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing one more song. Though I walk through the valley And I can't see the way When the shadows surround me, I will not be afraid, for I know you are with me, you will always provide, though the path may be lonely, you will stay by my side, I will I'll trust in you alone for the Lord my shepherd leads me leads me and he is all I need in the dark
In your love it pursues me All the days of my life I will rest my soul I'll trust in you beautiful song that uh, calls our mind back to one of the greatest uh, psalms that we know in the scripture, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? That's what leads us to, to sing that chorus that we have the shepherd and he's all that we need. And what a great thing for us to be reminded of and encouraged in as we gather together for worship this morning. And it's one of the things that, that I hope you are able to leave with today is to recognize the sufficiency of Christ and the fullness of Christ and that his love does pursue you wherever you are. And uh, many of you know, if you've been with us at any point in time, you recognize that when I uh, have a chance to, to preach each week, I often begin our time together and going to God's word through a time of prayer. And we often try to capture the spirit of the, the day. We try to acknowledge the need for the Spirit of God to come and awaken our hearts and our minds. And I want to do that here in just a moment, but also uh, occasionally have call or reason to offer some specificity to those prayers and uh, provide some details to those prayers and spe special focus. And I want to do that this morning, um, in particular, as we heard it mentioned about the situation in the Middle East and the things transpiring in Afghanistan. And uh, I, we know that the world is watching and that there's a lot uh, that we've all See, un have seen unfold over the last week, and I've just been struck by it, especially today, thinking about the privilege that we have to come in here and to worship and to sing and, and to just think about if we were in that situation, and if you just for a moment imagined being in Afghanistan and the sort of concerns and the worries and the, the threats and the confusion the, the sadness, the despair, all the things that are taking place over there, that if there was ever a place in the world right now that needs a shepherd to know that they are loved and that they can walk through the deepest valleys and not be alone, it's, it's those people. And we're called to pray uh, for brothers and sisters, and that doesn't just mean believers, that means for all people, and so that's really what I want us to do is we take time to obviously prepare for God's word this morning. I also want to make sure that we are mindful of what's taking place around the world. Because when we think about the prayer of UBC to say that we want to see God's power unleashed in our lives, this church, this community, in this world, so that every tongue, tribe, and nation can come to know and proclaim the saving work of Jesus Christ, that includes moments exactly like what we're seeing transpire across the world. And so 
our prayers need to reflect that desire. So let's take some time, mindful not just of the moments that we'll share together this morning, but the things that are taking place in Afghanistan. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we recognize uh, the beautiful gift of calling you shepherd and to know that you lead us through all valleys and all seasons, God, that you light our way, that you pursue us with your love. Father, that we can truly come in here and sing, no matter what we carry, that uh, you are all that we need. And we pray that that would be a truth that we would be encouraged by this morning and that by extension, Father, we would also lift up the people of, of Afghanistan this morning, Father. Uh, we have identified ways that we hope to help with felt needs and physical needs and to prepare ourselves for any of those who may find themselves in our midst and in this community. But God, we know that all those efforts um, ring empty if they're not supported through prayer, knowing that Father, we need to come before your throne and plead uh, on their behalf, God, that you would once again be sovereign, that you would uh, provide protection, Father, and that the hope of Jesus would reign supreme. Uh, and so, Father, continue to give us the wisdom to know how to navigate such a situation. Uh, we pray for that wisdom, not just for us individually, but for us as a nation, as a global community, uh, but also, Father, this, that you would once again um, allow this to be a season, an opportunity where your name is exalted. And so equip us as your church. Father, we know that we get equipped by coming to your word, by coming with open hearts and minds and anticipating that your spirit will speak and move in power. And so that's what we do now, Father. We come not out of habit, not out of routine. Father, eliminate our distractions, empty our minds of anything else, and let us come with eager anticipation and expectation that you will once again mold us and shape us and conform us to your good, pleasing, and perfect will. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning, church. Everybody doing well? Summer's officially over. Can I get an amen? You're like, no, no. There's no amen in that. Uh, man, it's, it is a fun time of year. I love getting a chance to do the Bible presentation. Uh, just as a quick word, I, I failed to mention this in the time, that if you are a guest or visitor and your children uh, are with us this morning. They go to an uh, age-appropriate Bible study during the sermon time, and then we dismiss on the playground uh, there on the East Lawn. Uh, we've got youth that are gathering uh, regularly now on Sunday mornings and also beginning Wednesday nights there in September. We've got college starting back up, and so a lot of great things taking place here within our church, and our church is, is one that is really focused on the community. Uh, when we think about this time of year, one of the updates I wanted to provide for you is that we try to really invest in the community, especially in local schools, elementary schools. Our church has partnered and ministered to Daggett Elementary and Seminary Hills Park Elementary for the last several years. And this past week, we were able to deliver 135 gift cards to those two schools to bless and encourage the staff at both of those schools as they start a new year. Uh, we, we deliver food to families that are associated with those schools each week. We got people coming and packing groceries uh, uh, every Monday, and then we've got volunteers going and delivering uh, to those families that are in need that are associated with those schools every Wednesday. And so it, just as a reminder, as we start back up at this time of year, not only are the things that you're seeing happening on this campus, but the things that are happening off this campus, and that when you really give of yourself to this church in whatever capacity, you, you know that People are being fed, people are being encouraged, and we're doing everything we can to take the gospel uh, where it needs to be. And so we're really excited about that. Also very excited that this time of year allows us to welcome back college students. Welcome, college students. It's exciting to have you here. Yeah. Uh, good to see some familiar faces back. Good to see some new faces. And uh, we're excited uh, for you all as well. I, I was in a conversation not too long ago. I can't remember who it was with exactly. Uh, but we were talking about if you could go back and relive any stretch of your educational years, right? So kindergarten through senior in college, wh which stretch would you want to go back and redo? And uh, I, I know Jennifer, for her, her answer is typically high school. She loved high school. I did as well. But for me, if I had to answer that question, I for sure would choose college. I loved those four years in college. It was, it was some of the best. And so if you are a college student and you're nearing the end, of your time or you're new and you're just starting it, wherever you are in your journey, man, savor it, cherish it, enjoy it. It's truly such a unique season of life. I, I know when I went to uh, my college experience at the University of Oklahoma, amen, right, boomer, something, any effort, okay. When I went to the University of Oklahoma, it was an interesting transition for me because I really didn't know anybody there. Uh, I didn't have any 
peer groups that are awaiting any sort of social uh, connections that I was going to be able to just kind of gravitate into. I kind of had to fend for myself, and it, and it resulted in me trying to cultivate a whole new network of relationships when I got there. And that was a really interesting thing to go through. Uh, one of the things that I did as a, as a college student was uh, joined a fraternity. And so within those first couple of weeks, I went through Rush and got kind of this full-on overwhelming exposure to the Greek life. And one of the things that was really interesting was how you encountered so many different reputations and stereotypes that were associated with every fraternity house, right? You would hear this from different people that I'd go through rush with. They're like, oh, you know, you want to stay away from that house because the, those guys are crazy. Or this house right here, man, they're the partiers. This, this crew over here, they're really smart. They're the, the academics. This one, they've got a lot of the athletes. This one, they're all from the country. Like every house had some form of reputation and stereotype that was applied to them. And that was true for sororities as well. And, and the reality was is that wasn't just true for Greek life. That was true for campus life. I mean, you had different campus ministries that had certain reputations and stereotypes. You had leadership groups that had all these different reputations and stereotypes. And so it was just kind of this, this assault on this experience where, especially not knowing anybody, where I was trying to constantly make judgments on who people were, what groups they fit in, and then also evaluate myself to figure out which one do I best fit into. And, and it was a really interesting experience for me, which I would love to say is confined to the college experience, but I think we all know it's not, right? And isn't this kind of how we live life, right? We go through life and we have all these stereotypes and all these judgments and these perceptions that we assign to people, these labels that we give to certain groups, and we identify them according to these ideologies or, or all these different principles or their skin color or whatever it is. And then we evaluate ourselves and determine, do I actually fit with that group? Should I associate with this group? We're constantly making these judgments about the world around us and ourselves. And I, and I think that's kind of the, the question for us to wrestle with this morning is, through what lens do you see yourself and do you see others? That's the question that I want us to wrestle with. What lens do you see yourself and do you see others? That's what I hope we have a chance to wrestle to the ground this morning. We're going to do so by continuing our series uh, through the parables of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 6. We started this series last week, and it was an introduction to this theme that we're going to look at the power of story, and in particular how Jesus' parables changed the world. And, and part of what we tried to lay as a groundwork last week is to recognize that story is a very unique thing that we are designed to respond to. Like our brains actually respond to storytelling in a very different way than receiving other information. Different chemicals are released. And so storytelling really aids us in our ability to learn, in, in our ability to retain information, and it really exerts influence and helps us actually change our behavior. So it was no wonder then, as we said last week, that this becomes one of Jesus' primary methods of teaching, was to teach through storytelling. But the specific type of storytelling that Jesus offers are parables, right? And so a parable is kind of a unique sort of story. It's a story that is intended to illustrate a point or to provide a lesson. And we talked last week that, that in particular with parables, what Jesus will do is take something that is commonly known and commonly understood, like farming, right, or... or um, life or nature, and then use those common understandings to explain something that is more uncommon and lesser known, like the kingdom of God, or the character of God, or the nature of God. And so you have these beautiful stories that Jesus uses to consistently teach on these things, and they typically arrive at a place where there's a certain question or challenge for the hearer, for the recipient of the story, where they then begin to wrestle with, am I going to follow this lesson that has just been taught? Am I going to choose to believe or am I going to go a different way? And so they are very thought-provoking and very engaging. And, and so that's part of what we're going to get a chance to see as we go through this series. Now, last week, the first parable we looked at is a short parable in Luke chapter 5 at Levi's banquet that focused on new wine. Right? You remember the, the summation that Jesus offers there that that you don't put new wine into old wineskins because if you do, the old wineskins burst, the wine flows on the ground, everything's ruined, but rather you put new wine into new wineskins. And the, the message that we really try to emphasize there is essentially what Jesus was trying to say is that the kingdom of God was new. Man, it was different. This was not the same old thing. He was not coming to provide an extension 
of the old way of doing things. He was coming to bring a new covenant, a new kingdom. And so the reason the Pharisees couldn't understand what was going on and they were asking these questions, why are you associating with, with sinners and tax collectors and why don't your disciples fast and pray is because they were trying to take who Jesus was and fit him into an established system. Right? They had the wrong perception. Jesus was like, man, you think you're at a funeral and you should be at a wedding. So he's constantly trying to say, this is something new. So we try to apply that to our context last week by saying that we do the same thing. And the, the, the way that I tried to bring it into our mistake or the things that we often establish as a system that can hindrance our understanding of the gospel is this kind of rhythm that we've fallen into, especially in American culture, where we just love creating buildings and filling them. Like that's a lot of times how we experience Jesus and how we discern effectiveness of the gospel. It's like, well, here's a, here's a building, let's fill it. And we'll, we'll talk all day long about the sort of content that brings people into that building. We'll, we talked about old versus new and do we want it to be traditional, we want it to be modern, we want it to be edgy. And all this, it's all the same approach. It's all the same philosophy. And, and what my point was last week is there's nothing wrong with tradition. There's nothing wrong with seeing something modern. But if your whole philosophy and understanding of the gospel is just to fill a building, you've missed it. Right? That the kingdom of God is, is this message that tells us sin and death don't win. And when you truly believe that in your heart, you live differently. Right? And, and you engage the world around you differently. And, and you encounter obstacles and hardships differently in a manner then that changes everything. Essentially what we're recognizing is that the gospel in the kingdom of God is not about come and see, come and sit in a pew. The gospel is go and make, right? Go and demonstrate an awareness that sin and death don't win. And so that's, that's setting the tone, right? And that was kind of what we tried to establish last week. Today we move a little bit further into Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 6. And here's where we find ourselves in Luke's gospel. If you were to pick up in verse 17, you would see a reference to Jesus gathering with those on a level place. This is often referred to as the Sermon on the Plain, right? Very different than the Sermon on the Mount, which you find in Matthew's gospel. Sermon on the Mount is one of the most well-known pieces of Jesus's teaching. Uh, much more lengthy and more detailed than what we find here in Luke chapter 6, but there are some similarities. You see some of those similarities at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Plain with something that feels like and sounds like the Beatitudes, right? But then, but then Jesus kind of progresses from there into one of the most powerful lessons that I would say he ever offers to his followers or to any of those that heard his teaching, right? Where he picks up in Luke chapter 6, right after those uh, beatitudes or those blessings and woes is he talks about loving your enemy. That's a really powerful teaching when you stop and reflect. Right? He, he says it very clearly. All right, so you love those who love you. You do good to those who do good to you. You lend to those who lend to you. So what? What credit is that to you? Everyone does that. But I tell you, love your enemies. Do good to those who are harmful to you, to persecute you. Lend to those without expecting anything in return. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Now I go to links to, to point this out as a context because I believe this teaching uh, correlates very importantly with what we're going to be looking at today. And I also think it provides a very important question. Perhaps it is that teaching that we need in our country and in our society more than any other. Love your enemies. Right, because we've got all these labels, we've got all these stereotypes, we've got all these groups, we've got all these folks that we've more or less have assigned a certain category to and we've decided if we're going to affiliate or not and it has created a breeding ground for hostility and frustration and anger and tension. And so let me ask you, how, how well are you doing at fulfilling what Jesus has asked you to do when he says love your enemies? Like when you think about people in your life or groups in your life that stir that anger, that stir that frustration? Have you really found yourself at a place where you can say, no, I can actually love them and expect nothing in return? I, I, that's really, I think, where we have to begin some of the work this morning, is I would actually challenge you, think about those people. Maybe it is a certain group that you are just so frustrated with and that you find yourself being angered by because of their ideologies, their principles, or whatever it is, or maybe it's specific people who have wronged you, that have hurt you, people in your family, friendships, whoever it is. Think of that list of people this morning. Have them in your head right now. 
And then I just want you to pray a simple prayer. Lord, help me love them like you love them. Right? Love your enemies. The point is this. Before we get to this parable, Jesus sets the tone of mercy. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. And that's what gives us the on-ramp to the parable we're going to be looking at this morning. So let's follow along in verse 37 of Luke, 36, or Luke chapter 6. He says, Jesus says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And he also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. All right, so this passage this morning to me is one that is worthy and demands, worthy of and demands some very thoughtful introspection and evaluation. And the reason I say that is because I would be willing to argue, and I could be wrong, but I'd be willing to argue that this passage is taken out of context perhaps more than any other passage we see in Scripture. Maybe not more, but it's at least in the top. And there's good reason for that, right? Because there's some things in this passage, in this teaching, that our minds and our hearts instinctively grab a hold to, right? That we, we want to use because it correlates so well with especially the mantra that we see in our culture. Right, so when you hear Jesus say, don't judge lest you be judged, man, we kind of grab a hold of that. When we see this imagery of don't try to remove the speck of sawdust from your brother's eye and ignore the plank in your own, we hold on to that because what that does for us is create a ready-made defense system that we can utilize whenever we find ourselves encountering critique or ridicule or judgment. Right? I mean, it, it's the ultimate escape clause anytime we ever get a hint of accountability being breathed our way. And because of the cultural mantra, which is what? Right? Don't judge me. You do you. I'll do me. But you have no right to judge who I am. That's the mantra of our culture. And so we can easily just flow into that mantra and get to claim Jesus in the process. Right? Even Jesus says, man, don't judge lest you be judged. Why are you picking on me and ignoring the plank in your own eye? Like we can so easily pull this out of context and clip it down and use it as the defense mechanism that allows us to rationalize our behavior and conduct ourselves in a manner that we want to and continually be blind to the things that, that really we need to be paying attention to. And so it deserves introspection because even though there's a level of truth to that interpretation, it is woefully insufficient. It is incredibly incomplete of what Jesus is actually trying to teach. All right, so let's, let's try to dive into it for a little bit this morning, okay? The first thing that we really need to wrestle with is just the notion of judgment at all. So the way that you would define judgment is exactly how you would think you would, right? It's to make a decision or a conclusion to evaluate something based on whether or not it was legal, right? A lot of times this was used in the realm of legality, uh, whether or not something was right or wrong. In its most intense definition, I guess you could say, uh, it would be defined and understood to be condemning as guilty, right? And so, so when you think about all the different nuances of judgment, we need to give some consideration to what's really being emphasized here. And I think where we get our contextual cues is by what Jesus says next, right? Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned, right? The, what we need to understand is that what Jesus is really trying to emphasize here in these first two statements is really a sort of judgment that leads to condemnation, right? To condemning others is guilty. He is not implying to take this absolutely that you all of a sudden have this disregard for any form of moral evaluation, right? And that you just let anything go, right? That you just completely let go of ethics. Because if you take it absolutely and say, well, you can't judge, well, then you really shouldn't judge anything that could be considered to be right or wrong, right? And yet we make those determinations all the time, right? We look at people's behavior. We look at uh, things that our kids are doing, we look at things that are happening in the world, and we are constantly making judgments to determine in conclusions, is this right, is this wrong, right? So, so we're constantly judging certain things, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. 
And the Bible, I would say, gives us a very clear example to say that that's part of what it means to be a follower, to understand right and wrong, to have accountability. How many times do we see in the scripture this admonition to say, you need to consider the word of God that is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, right? Those are things that help us judge and determine and evaluate who we are. Condemnation is very different, right? Do not condemn lest you be condemned, right? So what we really need to do is have a little bit more of a holistic picture of what judgment biblically really implies. And so if you think about the way that Judaism would have developed at this point in time, their notion of judgment would have been built upon the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is very clear. There is one judge, and who is he? God, right? There is one judge who gets to determine right and wrong, who gets to enforce that justice, and that is God, and he is the one that establishes those norms, he establishes those rules, and he is the one that ultimately holds that responsibility. And what you discover as you begin to understand the nature of God as judge in his justice is that he stands over and against in an opposition to one primary thing, which is what? Sin. God detests sin because of his holiness, because of his righteousness, He stands in judgment and in condemnation against sin. It cannot be in his presence. And so that leads us to the human dilemma, does it not? Because what do we learn through the scriptures? What do we learn when we read things like Romans? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all stand condemned before God because of our sinfulness. Every single one of us. We stand before this divine judgment worthy of that condemnation because of our brokenness. And yet, as soon as we encounter that dilemma, what do we find? We find good news. We find the gospel. We find that this God who is judge is also rich in mercy. And he forgives us in Christ Jesus. And with Christ, we find this forgiveness that leads us to grace. And so here's the point. The moment that you restrict judgment, especially divine judgment, then you restrict the gospel itself. It's only in our awareness of our own sinfulness that we stand condemned, that we truly appreciate the forgiveness that is extended to us through Christ. Right? And so judgment is more here, in my estimation, to be couched in this light of not saying you're supposed to just completely disregard any sort of moral evaluation, but you're supposed to move with this understanding that we stand in solidarity with one another of all being guilty of sin. Does that make sense? Like We're we're all in this together. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and yet we can treasure that reality because it leads us to the gospel, and that's really what I think Jesus is trying to push here, is not so much this... um, prohibition towards judgment, but to rather create a picture of how we should actually live. I think that's one of the things we have to wrestle with in Christianity is a lot of times we can mold our Christian faith into a list of prohibitions and a list of things that we're not supposed to do, and we miss the greater emphasis on who we are supposed to be and the things that we are supposed to do, right? And so more than we should read this passage and walk away thinking about don't judge, we should walk away thinking about what does it mean to be forgiven, And what does it mean to forgive? That's what he's calling us to. Forgive others if you have been forgiven. Give to others, right? That's the posture that he wants to create in us, for us to exercise that sense of forgiveness to other people. And so what does it mean to forgive? When you look at this term, I really love the definition of it. It it speaks to uh, releasing, to dismiss, or to set free which tends to make a lot of sense, right? When we think about somebody that's wrong to us or, or an enemy, right? To correlate this with the other part of Jesus' teaching, a lot of times what we think is that we need to uh, harbor that resentment because of the way that they wronged us. But what forgiveness does is we let go of that resentment and we set free uh, their sense of guilt that they may carry for the wrong that they've committed. Right, so we're setting people free by forgiving them. But what's really interesting about the nature of forgiveness is that we're not just setting the other person free, we're setting ourselves free in the process. This is actually something that is not just promoted by Jesus, but it's promoted by science as well. Just so happened 
uh, that there was an article that was published in Relevant Magazine this week, and it was titled, The Scientific Case for Forgiveness. And, and they, they cite all this different research of how when you become a forgiving person, what it does to you emotionally, mentally, and physically, and how it actually helps you in the process. Let me read a couple quotes to you from the magazine. It says, scientists have found that victims of severe abuse who forgive their abuser receive measurable improvements in psychological and physical health. When compared to control groups, the forgivers healed faster and more completely. Right? And so part of what we see here is that the act of forgiveness has shown us through research that it actually improves our overall health and our overall mental stability as well. But when we harbor that resentment, it doesn't just keep that other person under their guilt, but it keeps us in a level of captivity also. Here's how the article continues. It says, holding a grudge against one who wounded us doesn't affect them, but instead it impairs us. When we don't forgive, we put ourselves in mental and emotional and physical bondage. The person who hurt us may have put us in a cage, but we're the only ones who can set ourselves free. That's the beauty of forgiveness, right? It, it sets not just the one who has wronged us, but it sets us free as well. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to promote for those who follow us. And the extent of that forgiveness should be abundant. So when he, when he goes into that reference to a measure that is pressed down and shaken out and running over, the, those are all phrases and terms that speak to abundance. Right? There's this overflow of forgiveness that we find in the gospel. Right? That there's not just a short measure of forgiveness and grace and mercy that we find in Christ. It's an abundant level of grace and mercy, and so that should be abundant in our lives as well. So just as Christ has forgiven us, so we should forgive others. And that's what Jesus is calling us to, is to live that life of forgiveness. Now, that is all setting the tone for the parable, right? for the actual story that he is about to teach. And I, and I love the way he teaches this, and I think it gives us some really powerful lessons. Okay? So he, he transitions there to talk about the blind leading the blind, and if that happens, they're both going to fall into the pit. That is more than likely a reference to the Pharisees and the disciples of the day. And his whole point is that when you're a disciple, there's a rabbi that you're following, right? And you're trusting their view of the world, you're trusting what they're teaching, you're trusting their conduct, you're trusting their example. But if the rabbi that you're following doesn't actually understand God, doesn't actually understand his heart, his character, his nature, doesn't actually understand the kingdom, then that's the blind leading the blind and you're both gonna fall into a pit, right? And so the Pharisees are living a world where they've assigned all these labels, sinners, tax collectors, drinkards, all, all, these, all these people that we don't associate with, and here's what you should do, and here's how we do it, and they are living this way where they're signing those labels and they're signing those stereotypes and their judgments, and they're condemning people in the process. And, and Jesus is saying that whole mindset is like the blind leading the blind. You have no concept of the mercy of God, and it's leading you into a pit. Right? So he's challenging that. And so rather than he redirects them to follow him, Right? And he talks about a student that is trained will become like their teacher. Now, I love this part, and, and I, and I want to take a brief moment just to dive into it for a second. Right? How does he say it? He says, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. This is a great reminder that you and I are called to be like Christ. To be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, means you're committing yourself to a lifetime of trying to be more and more like Christ. And so I wanna ask you, like, how's it going? Let me ask a very specific question. Are you more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? Like, if you really think about that, have you been molded into becoming more and more like the teacher that you say you follow? You think about all the, the stresses of the pandemic, you think about all the disruptions to life, the anxieties, the concerns, all the things that we've had to go through as a, as a world, how has it shaped you? Are you more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? If your answer is yes, then you can probably point to some very specific reasons as to why. If your answer is no, then you can probably point to some very specific reasons as to why. And more often than not, those reasons will have to do with training. Have you actually invested yourself in an environment and in a lifestyle where you will actually grow and be trained to become more like Jesus. 
right? This stuff doesn't happen magically, right? Like, like I hate running, and I mean that with every sense that I can convey it. Like, I don't, I don't run unless there's a sport that I'm playing or somebody's chasing me, and that's about it, okay? And so, like, if I left church today and just ran a half marathon, do you know how ugly it would be? Like, by the time I got to mile five, who are we kidding, mile two, you realize, like, you guys, guys, we need to stop him. Like, let's pray for him. Like, he's not going to make it because I don't train. And that's exactly how so many of us approach following Jesus, right? Like, we get out and we start running this race that is life with no training, no investment, and it continually knocks us over, and we can't figure out why because you haven't trained yourself to become more like Jesus, you have to equip yourself. What does that look like? This is where for us in this church, we really try to emphasize discipleship groups and renewal. Like we're not just trying to fill up your calendar. We don't think you're just sitting around bored on Wednesday. Hey, here's one more thing that you can do. Like we legit believe that you should be in community with other brothers and sisters and you should open the word of God. Not, not Beth Moore, not Francis Chan, not Timothy. Like the word of God and read it and ask each other, what does this teach us about God? What does this teach us about ourselves? How do we hold each other accountable? And when we have those questions and we have that sort of environment and we meaningfully invest in it, you know what happens? We find the words of Christ being spoken to us through the body of Christ that we can become transformed by Christ. Right? This is why we talk about these things. You know what? Train can also be defined here as to mend or restore. So we talk about renewal, we think about those, those obstacles that can get in the way. We, we go through these, these challenges in life, these struggles in life that can feel like mountains at times that limit our ability to truly invest in becoming more Christ-like. Well, that's what renewal is all about. Let's, let's walk through those things together. Let's find restoration, let's heal our hearts. And in the process, we can discover that even in the hard times, we can become more like Jesus. And that's what he's saying. Train those, everyone who is fully trained becomes more like their teacher. That's what we're called to. We're called to become more like Christ. And so if your answer to that question is likely to connect it to what sort of investment you are making in being trained and growing in your understanding of who Christ is and what it means for you. All right, so he establishes this, essentially saying, you, you don't want to follow the wrong person. Don't follow the blind. Follow me. Invest in this training. And then you get the parable of, or at least the imagery of the sawdust versus the plank, <clears throat> right? Why would you pay attention to the speck of sawdust in your eye or in your brother's eye and ignore the plank in your own? And, and I think a lot of times we can maybe miscalculate what Jesus is really emphasizing here because of the difference in size between a speck of sawdust and a plank, right? That, that maybe that really your issue is far greater than the issue that is facing the person you're trying to correct, right? You've got a whole host of things. And I don't that may be part of what Jesus is conveying, but to me, it's, it's really not the main point. Right? Here's the main issue that I see that Jesus is pointing out to, that the mistake that is really going on in people's minds when they do that is not that you have a greater issue and the other one is smaller, but really that you're just not paying attention to their issue. They're not paying attention to their own sinfulness. They're not paying attention to the plank in their eye. That's, that's essentially what he says. Why are you trying to reach to the remove the speck in your brother's eye and you pay no attention to the plank in your own. So to pay attention means to give careful and thoughtful examination. I think this is maybe where we fall short, right? Is that a lot of times uh, the reason it's so easy for us to point fingers and label and throw up stereotypes is because we're not even paying attention to our own selves. When's the last time you gave a real thorough examination of the sin in your life, like the things that you wrestle with, your insecurities, your failures, your mistakes, your hurts. Like when's the last time you really evaluated those things and gave name to them before Christ and, and confessed them and acknowledged them in his presence? See, a lot of times we flippantly are like, yeah, I'm a sinner, but look at all these other things that are going on in the world. And we fail to really stop and pay attention to what we are carrying. And that's critical. Right? That we have to, to truly live this life is to come before Christ 
and acknowledge these failures, acknowledge these insecurities, confess them, and what do we discover? Grace. <laughs> right, the more you invest yourself in community and you invest in that training, what do you discover? You encounter the gospel over and over and over again, and you keep running into God's amazing grace and his incredible forgiveness. And so you pay attention to these failures and these shortcomings. And then you remove this plank out of your own eye. How do you remove it? Repentance. But like, that's what it means to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is committing yourself and signing up for a lifetime of repentance. When's the last time you truly repented of something? Not just that I'm sorry, but was like, no, I'm, I'm genuinely going to try to go another direction with this. Like, those are the first steps. Those are the first things we have to do. Pay attention to the plank in our own eye. Pay attention to our own sinfulness, and then repent of it. And then what happens? This is the part of the scripture that no one ever remembers and likes to quote. Then it's removed, and then what do you do? Then you help your brother remove the speck of dust in his eye. So we always leave that part out. There is still a place where you have this loving accountability with one another, but the first step is to remove it out of your own eye. Here's what happens when we take that first step. I love the way Jesus says it in the story. Then you will see clearly. I love that. Once you remove this plank in your eye, then you'll see clearly how to help them remove the speck of sawdust in theirs. To see, see, one of the issues that we face in our world today is we're not seeing people clearly. <laughs> and if you think of why, like if you think maybe back through that list of folks that I asked you to think of earlier, those, those folks that maybe stir up that frustration, that hatred, that anger, that hostility, right, the longer your list, it's probably because the more out of touch you are with God's grace that you don't really see not just them clearly, but even yourself, <laughs> right? But the more you understand God's mercy and how it's impacted you, then you're less likely to look out and see stereotypes and labels and categories and see actual people. And you're gonna be better able to point them to the same grace and mercy and forgiveness that you yourself have received because you see yourself clearly as a sinner, broken, needing forgiveness, just like they are. And so the same grace that you've received, you are quick to extend to someone else because you see clearly. Now that's really hard to do. Is it not? In fact, I would say it's, it's almost an art. But we need to be reminded this morning of just how transformative and how powerful it is when we truly embody that type of forgiveness. And so there's uh, an example for us that I want to close our time with this morning. And it's one that I would imagine most of you are familiar with, or at least saw when it transpired. And I remember when it first happened, being so captivated by it, I was like, that's, like I'm preaching on that tomorrow. You know, like I was just, but then I was like, no, and we'll wait. We'll wait until the Lord says, now's the time. And this week, I was like, this is it. This is the time. So I've been thinking about this for well over a year. It, it started in uh, September 6, 2018. Um, many of you know this story. An off-duty police officer uh, in Dallas by the name of Amber Geiger uh, walked into an apartment uh, that she thought was hers and fatally shot a 26-year-old man by the name of, of Botham Jean. And her explanation for it was that she thought I was, she thought she was walking into her own apartment um, and mistook both of them as being an intruder. And so it was a tragic story and one that captured the attention of so many of us here locally, but also nationally because of the uniqueness of the story. I mean, there were a lot of questions about, you know, do we really believe her explanation? Uh, how do you walk into an apartment that is not yours, and then shoot somebody in the process. So the, the question of just the uniqueness of it, but then obviously because of the fact that she was a white police officer and he was a black man. And so there's a narrative that we're very familiar with in our country, right? All the questions of racial tension, 
um, the, the racial unrest that we constantly see erupting in our society. And so my point is this, like this story, this, this moment had all the ingredients needed to throw up categories and stereotypes. It had everything you could possibly want to, to draw lines and classify people as enemies and to respond with hatred and hostility. And then comes Botham's brother, Brandt. It's common in these court cases for family members of the victim to have a chance to speak to the accused. I don't even know that any of us can really imagine what we would say in a moment like that. Like if you really put yourself in his shoes and you think about all the things swirling in your head, is she telling the truth? All the questions of, of racial tension, dealing with the pain and grief of losing your brother at the age of 26. Like think of all the emotions you're carrying. What would you say? Let's see what Brant said. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just, I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the thing, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see I I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please. Yes.
That's forgiveness. You know, I've watched that video several times, and you know what stands out to me? The more I watch it, there's this moment near the beginning where he says, all of us have done something we shouldn't have. And that's somebody that understands all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he says, if you go to God, I know he will forgive you. Sounds like a man who has paid attention to his own sin and festive and experienced personally God's amazing grace. And so it allows him to look at her and say, I forgive you. I want the best for you. I love you. And in that, he sets both of them free. And that's the power of forgiveness. And a great reminder of the sort of life that we are called to live. The lens through which we should see ourselves and see others is through the lens of God's amazing grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us. So God, we do come before you and we acknowledge and confess that we are sinners. God, each of us with specific things, specific failures, mistakes, shortcomings, insecurities, God, that demonstrate our need for redemption, our need for healing, our need for restoration. God, we recognize that we are unworthy in your presence, and yet, Father, when we stand before your throne, we find your mercy. We see that you are a God that is rich in love, quick to forgive, and that forgiveness was borne out for us on the cross through the blood of our Savior, guaranteed to us by an empty tomb. So, Father, as we navigate this life, navigate this world that's filled with labels and stereotypes, in a world that is rich with hostility and aggression. God, help your church, help us individually be people who are quick to forgive and to love. God, that we would see clearly as you see. God, that we would always cling to your amazing grace. We love you, Father. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Well, let's think about this grace that we've received. And as we do so, use this as an opportunity to confess and pay attention to your own shortcomings. Use it as a way in your own heart to offer forgiveness to those in your life that need it. And for us all to focus ourselves on Christ and the amazing grace he extends to us all. Let's stand and sing together.
Father, we love you. So we leave here today desiring to see more clearly the world that you've entrusted to us. God, help us to see ourselves and those around us through the lens of this amazing grace. We thank you, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Thank you all again for being with us. Those of you that joined us online, hope you all have a great week. Those of you here, let me encourage you to take some time to stop by the East Lawn. Uh, families, that's where you pick up your children as well. Uh, we encourage you to use those south exits or the preschool exit. But thank you all for being here. You may go in peace. Have a great Sunday. Thank you.